What's up, folks? This is Tony Brewer. You're listening to or watching as the case may be. Cogitations. Cogitations is the podcast where we think about things, we contemplate them, we turn them over in our minds, and then we discuss them. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28, Daniel writes, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me. My countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Folks, we're not going to keep the matter in our heart. We're going to talk about it. Today, we're going to talk about me being late. I do not like being late. I do not like running behind. I had no choice today. Uh, so we're doing a 1245 live stream instead of a 12 noon live stream, which actually most of my listening audience, it's a, it would be a 1045 live stream instead of a 10 a.m. live stream. We go live at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, and uh, that's a, that's 11 Atlant or 11 Eastern and, and 12 Atlantic. I'm all the way, I'm almost in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm on the east, east coast of Canada, and we're under an, an hour ahead of anywhere in the States. So anyway, uh, so glad you're here. We got a good crowd shaping up. I honestly was like, what What do I talk about? There, there's so much on my mind. There's so much I've been studying, you know, preparing for lessons and sermons. And I've got some articles and stuff in the mix that, that are more than just the normal uh, daily articles that I put out on Substack, which incidentally, if you're not subscribed for free over on Substack, uh, Christianity.com. Uh, well, hold on a second. I'll, I'll put it up on the. I'll put it up on the deal. Subscribe to Substack, substack.com forward slash at Christianity Now. That actually, that, that looks like a profile page. You know what? I think that I can get you a better, I think I can get you a better link, an easier link to remember. No, I don't want to copy and paste. Dashboard. My bad. Hold on. I just messed up. Okay, visit my site. One more time. Christianitynow.substack.com. Copy. And I will put it in the show notes, in the live stream. And if you want to use that link, you can go to Christianity Now. You can sign up for free and you can get access to an article every day for five days of the week. The week, the working days, Monday through Friday. And then Aaron Dotson is doing a weekly, a weekly, um, I may have said podcast. I meant articles. We put out an article Monday through Friday for everyone. That's a totally free subscription. Then on Saturday, Aaron Dotson puts out an article that uh, he's writing through the book of Romans. And so that's for our premium subscribers, and we're trying to add value to for our premium subscribers. The subscription is just $5 a month. Substack gives us like 97% of that money. It's really it's really good. Anyway, uh, so Substack is the place to be if you want to support us, if you want to help us out. Hello, Sazed Ahmed. And then now, let's get into the podcast. Uh, a few years ago, a buddy of mine shared a Facebook post, and I'm going to read it to you now. It's a short post. I developed it into an article, and in the in the show notes is an article based on this quote, based on this post. But anyway, uh, yesterday I shared this, and it was it was from uh, March 19th, 2023. This is from a friend of mine. It is just as profound now as when he posted it years ago. In the 4th century, Emperor Julian lamented the fact that Christians were so good to the poor that his pagan priest had nobody for which to care. His priest had been disgraced by the love of the church. He says, and this is Emperor Julian's lament, why then do we think that this is sufficient and do not observe how the kindness of Christians to strangers has done the most to advance their cause? I'm going to read that quote again. Why then do we think that this is sufficient and do not observe how the kindness of Christians to strangers 
has done the most to advance their cause. For it is disgraceful when no Jew is a beggar. And the impious Galileans, that's the name that was given to Julian, or given by Julian to Christians, that's a pejorative, support our poor in addition to their own. So the Christians were supporting the poor of the pagans. Do not therefore let others, that's Christians, outdo us in good deeds, while we ourselves are disgraced by laziness. And I ask the question, would the church still put Julian to shame? And I put forth to you today collectively, and I'm not trying to be negative Nelly, or I'm not trying to be black pill, but it's a large room for improvement, quite frankly, in how the church does benevolence. Folks, by this shall all men know you are my disciples indeed, if you have love one for another. I may not have seen enough. I will readily admit that. But I have seen a lot that causes me to say we need to have more teaching on being charitable, charity and kindness. I believe that if we claim to be the moral arbiters on the face of the earth, in other words, we're the ones that claim that we have uh, objective truth. I was talking to a woman the other day, and she first first time I met somebody up here that was quite frankly politically left wing. But I say that I probably met a bunch, but this woman was very vocal. So my point is this: um, she brought up politics. And then she immediately, whenever I said something that she couldn't argue with, and I wasn't mean, I wasn't even mean-spirited, it wasn't even a particularly strong argument, but she threw up the defense of, well, that's your truth. Everybody has their truth. I have my truth. You have your truth. The people that are going through that have their truth. And I'm like, well, and she was a shop owner. What I did not do, but what I really wanted to do, because remember, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to be charitable and kind. It don't always work, okay? But it worked that day. I'm proud of myself because what I wanted to say is, well, ma'am, you're a shop owner. If there's your truth and my truth, my truth is you don't own any of this, and I do, so I'm just going to carry this back to the house and use it because it's mine. Oh, no, because, see, in that situation, her truth and my truth would have been opposed to one another. And then the police would come if I acted on my truth. My, my, the police would come, and reality would reinstate itself quick, fast, and in a hurry. But again, charity, kindness. If we're going to win over the world if we're going to win them to the cause of Christ, nobody really cares much about spiritual things when they're suffering physically. And when you help them physically, they are way more affable and open to listening to your spiritual things. Because just like in the first century, a miraculous sign confirmed the word, in the 21st century, a charitable, loving, kind act confirms the word in people's mind. Think about it. If God is love, and he is, I believe he is, Whenever you're trying to tell somebody that they need to change their life, that they need to be a Christian, that they need to live soberly, righteously, godly, they need to leave the realm of uh, unrighteousness and worldly lust. Well, acts of kindness signify that message. 
just like acts of, mira- uh, acts of miracles did in the first century. In fact, in the first century, many of the miracles, the miraculous signs, were in and of themselves acts of love because healings and casting out of demons and stuff like that was, was done. And incidentally, whenever you look at Acts chapter 13 with Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, Paul struck a man blind. He did a miracle. And go read that, Acts chapter 13. The proconsul, he marveled at the word, not the miracle. Anyway, I I rambled on there a lot farther than I intended. Um, B. Sutradar, good to see you, and I know I'm I'm butchering your name, and you'll just have to extend some grace my way. Hello, Diana Harden, it's good to see you. She says, amen, Connie Barden, uh, good to see you this morning. Sword and Pearl, so glad that you're here. Um, I haven't said it in a while, but Sword and Pearl, uh, or not Sword and Pearl, but everybody, Y'all need to go check out Sword and Pearl's uh, YouTube channel. I haven't mentioned that in a while. She reads the Psalms, and uh, I think she does a good job. In fact, uh, Sword and Pearl, I I don't ever talk about it or anything, but uh, just for folks to to do it, you ought to drop a link in the chat. Or can you drop a link in the chat? I don't know if I don't know if YouTube allows it, but anyway. If you'll drive, if, you, if you're able to drop a link in the chat, drop a link in the chat, or just type type in the chat what they can what, what they can search in the search engine to find your channel. Scott Beck, in my community, we are woefully behind the Catholics and Lutherans who have established homeless shelters, food pantries, and senior care. Scott Beck, as as many times you hit the nail on the head, you cut right through the chase to the heart of the matter. And that's really kind of what I'm talking about today. Um, I am not of the mindset that all of the benevolence of the Lord's church needs to be individually. I, I think the Lord's church, I think, there's, I think there's great utility in pooling our money together and as, a, and as an institution on the local level, as an institution, uh, doing bigger and better things. Now, I understand, and I am fully admitting that there is a slope. It can be slippery, and we would have to be careful not to create a parachurch organization. But I think that four or five congregations can get together and pull their money and do something big like have an addiction counseling service have a have a uh, a rehab facility uh have a homeless shelter have a battered women's home stuff like that i i think i think four or five congregations could pull their money together and have um well for instance in the congregation up here we've got a therapist we got a medical doctor we've got a guy that does a type of, of physical therapy we could have a clinic that offers these services that caters to people who profess Christ. And we could also have that clinic where we take a certain amount of people because, you know, we, it, it'd have to be supported and stuff, but we would take a certain amount of people that would be indigent, homeless, what have you. Like there's a lot that could be done. I mean, it, it takes money. It's 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 quite a quite an expensive endeavor, but it could absolutely be done. And I think we should focus more on that because I think what happens is, for instance, a homeless shelter. I mean, it, it would take millions of dollars a year to run a homeless shelter. And I I think that maybe members of the Lord's Church they look at the whole and they don't go about seeing if it's even possible, and, and they look at that whole big meal and they think, I can never eat that, whenever the way the Lutherans and the Catholics got to where they are in benevolence is they didn't look at the whole meal and say, well, that's too big to eat. They looked at the whole meal and said, well, I can eat one bite of this at a time, and they, they just started chipping away at it. 
And I think we, I think, I think in the United States, the church of Christ is being put to shame by denominations, just like you, just like you said. And I think we, I, again, it's, it's one of those things would, would Emperor Julian's lament be true today? Let me tell you what I'm afraid of, and I'm deathly afraid of this. I'm afraid we've let the government, both in the United States and Canada, subsidize benevolence right out of the purview of the Lord's church. Benevolence always, well, he, he, I like the way Ben Shapiro describes this. He's a political pundit in the United States. Should, this is should, this is idyllic. I understand not everybody has access to this hierarchy, but this is ideal. As a young person, if you have a problem financially, you need to go to your close friends and family members first. Then you go, you go out to the community at large. Then you go to the church, or in Ben Shapiro's case, you go to the synagogue. And then if there's no help, then you take it above. Actually, he's, I think you may go to the church first, then the community at large, which would be local government. But then if there's, if there's no help, then you would have to go higher. The problem is with welfare and the way the welfare system is set up in Western culture, everybody just goes to daddy government. In fact, there's a, there's a viral video that's going around on TikTok of this young woman, and she talks about how the government is my baby daddy. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, the government is my baby daddy. I have these, I have these kids. They all have different baby daddies. They're schmucks. They don't do what they're supposed to. So I go to the government, and the government gives me money for diapers, for food. You know, if we want to do anything, that money comes from the government. Uh, we get housing from the government, insurance from the government. You know, the United States of America doesn't have socialized medicine unless you want to be a miscreant and not work. I think that we ought to let some of these people that refuse to do right I think we ought to let them get a little hungry. I mean, y'all can see the way I look. What if I told you I'm just up here broke and I don't even have enough money to eat and I'm starving? Do I look like I'm starving? That's the craziest thing in the world is you know that you don't have any problems to speak of in your nation if the poorest people among you that refuse to work on average, you're carrying 50 pounds of fat that they don't need. So that's the one side of the aisle. That's, that's the one side of the, of the issue. But the other side is there's people out there that actually need help. And even so, that young woman that talks about the government being her daddy, her baby daddy, rather, she needs help it too, and she needs kindness, and she needs love. The problem is the, the love and kindness she needs, she's not going to want. She's going to eschew that, and she's just going to want a handout. And I'm being judgmental. I'm judging based on the appearance. I'm judging based on what it appears to be. And based on everything that she's put out in the World Wide Web, that's a reasonable inference to make. But even so, what, what happens to, let's say you've got a, a, a young woman talking about other institutions absolutely putting us to shame. What happens in the congregation if you got a young woman and let's say we'll, we'll, we'll make this more palatable than what I usually do. What if you have a young woman who is a widow? Her and her husband got married at the age of 20 and 18. So he, he's 20, she's 18. They have four children by the time by, by the time the husband dies, and she's not but 26. So she's a young widow, 26, has four children. How do you treat that young woman? Now, here's what the Bible says. 
That young woman needs to consider being married again. She needs to be hunting up a man. She needs to get married again. That young woman needs to have, needs to get married again, or she needs to go out and get a job. That's what the scriptures teach. Go, go read Paul's writings about widows indeed. A widow indeed is a woman who is 60 years of age and upward, who is widowed, and who does not have family that's able to take care of her. Well, this young woman who's 25, she either needs to get married or she needs to go out and get a job. She doesn't need to be a welfare case of the church, however, and she really doesn't need to be a welfare case of the government. If she is a member of the Lord's church, she should not have to be on welfare. Now let me let me keep going. Should and and is is two different things. We are squarely in the realm of should, not is. And I say all the time on the Cogitations podcast and Christianity Now podcast, we don't deal with should and should not. We deal with is and is not. But in this case, we're doing a hypothetical. Now. She doesn't need to be a welfare case for the government or the church. And incidentally, even the widows 60 years old and upward were not welfare cases because the church was supposed to put them to work. In other words, the church was supposed to support them. But not for free. In other words, it wasn't a welfare case. They were supposed to work. But this 25 year old woman. She's got four children. How can you expect her to go get a job where she's able to support herself and the four children? What can the church do? Well, I tell you what the church can do. The church can be like, well, honey, I know it's going to be hard on you for the next few years. You know, you're you're young. You you got a you got a one year old, all the way up to a five year old, in four children. So or I guess a six-year-old. Anyway, don't, don't check my math too, too tightly there. We're going to pay for one full year of daycare, and we're going to pay one full year of your rent and utilities, and we want you to go out and get a job, and we, we're either going to we're either going to make sure that your children have daycare or we have the grannies in the church, they're going to take they're going to come over and watch your children to make sure that you don't have that burden. And for an entire year, we're going to let you go and work and, and we're going to we're going to take that burden off of you so that you can do what you need to do to take care of yourself. What is wrong with that? Why is that not the status quo? What about some of you in the audience? Is that, is that the status quo of, of where you are? I will tell you this. I have talked to people that are in denominations. Domin denominations that I know for a fact teach blatant false doctrine and are not leading anybody to heaven. And while they have missed the New Testament pattern of the church as far as doctrine, they are putting us to shame on the pattern of the New Testament church when it comes to practice out in the world, when it comes to existence and being and interacting with the community. And incidentally, there is even a faction within our own ranks about the quote-unquote institutional and non-institutional. I have found from my conversations with people who are quote unquote, and I again, I absolutely hate the designation, but for English, you got to have nomenclature. So the non institutional brethren that believe that the Bible restricts and dampens greatly exactly how and, and on whom you can spend the money that's in the church treasury, I have found that those people are way more giving than people who are part of the church that is called the institutional churches. And the reason being is because the folks in the non-institutional, they feel a, a self-responsibility. 
we're in a congregation of folks that are non or that are institutional that think that anything that the Bible allows any the, the money to be spent on anything. Well, if somebody comes up to the church and it, it's found out that they need help, nobody gets personally involved to help them. They think the church ought to do it. Not understanding that if you help them, that's the church helping them. Thank you, Zabriel. We appreciate you and appreciate you being here. We are absolutely blowing the live stream out of the water today. Good grief, man. 170 folks on the YouTube. But anyway, so th these are just my lamentations. My oh, my, I, it's, I am opining. And that's really probably not a lament, but that's, that's what this Emperor Julian, that's what he was saying. He's saying, listen, we're trying to grow a pagan religion. And these Christians are so kind. I mean, where do you want to be? Do you want to be a part of an organization that if you need anything, they just say, well, we'll pray for you? Or do you want to be a part of an organization that, you know what? Our our crops failed, and if we don't come up with $20,000 to uh, pay the mortgage through the for the rest of the year, we're going to lose the family farm. And then you want to be a part of a community that says, well, we'll pray for you and we hope something works out. Or do you want to be a part of a community that gets together, pulls their money and says, here, go pay your mortgage. What, what are we, what are we hoarding the money for? I went to an interview uh, with a, with a congregation my life is very beautiful. I don't believe beautiful and me have ever been used in the same sentence, <laughs> but thank you though. RH the hide. Good deal. All right. So sorry, let me, I appreciate the comment, but oh yeah, I, I was, I was interviewing for a position and you want to make sure that you're going to be as a gospel preacher, you want to be at a quote unquote sound church. Okay, so what do you mean by sound? Well, sound is in healthy, sound is in doctrinally correct. And the elders that I was talking to that day, they kept one of them kept using this phrase, "Well, you'll 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 really like it here. You find this is this is a sound church. We're a sound church. We're a sound church." And I, I was like, "Well, man, I'm so glad because you know I wouldn't be coming here. I wouldn't even be considered coming here." If your church wasn't sound. And then later on that day, it dawned on me. He, he, well, it didn't dawn on me. He actually, he, he told me what he meant by sound. They, they, they didn't owe any money on anything. Now, if you don't owe any money on anything, are you building up money in the treasury as a nest egg? And if so, what for? Is it the case that the Lord blesses us with this world's good and we hoard it up? Are we like the one talent man? Are we like the one talent man that just puts his talent, his, his unit of money in the dirt and hoards it because we're too scared to lose it. Let's go to the book of James again. Actually, man, I was going to read James chapter two, uh, 14 to the end of the chapter to make the point that we have to take action with our brethren. If our brethren, especially if our brethren are in need, we don't need to just be like, hey, you know, be you warmed and filled. I'll pray for you. We need to actually be involved. We need to disgrace the people that they would go to for help. We need to do more than daddy government. We need to be their people on whom they depend and on whom they lean. All right. Now, that's James chapter 2 if you want to read that. But let's go to James 
chapter 4. Let's see. Here it is. It's James chapter 5. I'm sorry. All right. James chapter 5. I want to start reading from the beginning. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Here's the thing. These people who had plenty of money, they were hoarding it. And they were, they were not doing the things with the money they were supposed to be doing because they, according to what James said, they were piling it up against the judgment. And I don't know if they thought they were going to pay God off whenever they got to the day of judgment or not. But I do know that's kind of what we, we think of. I think about the Chronicles of Narnia. And there's a character who is given, maybe it's a flute or something like that, or a horn, a silver horn maybe. I, don't, I can't remember. But Aslan, the, the great hero of the, of the story, of the epic, he had left the land. He had been gone for many, many years. And in, in your direst, in your most dire need, you're supposed to blow this horn. And what happened is the kid fell into the trap of, well, we're surrounded. We might not make it out. I've got a horn that if I blow it, the hero will come and save us. But the problem is I'm only supposed to blow it in my most dire of needs. And this, this need, this situation might not be the most dire situation I'll ever be in. And so you never, ever blow the horn. You never, never use the, the gift, the, the, the gift that, that you've been blessed with. God has given us great wealth in the Lord's church in Western culture in Canada and the United States. Why are we, why do we think we need several hundred thousand dollars in the bank? Why do we think we need tens of thousands of dollars in the bank? Why don't we see how much money we can spend on doing good and taking care of people and loving people? And we'll see if whether or not God doesn't give us that money back and then some. I am afraid that some of these congregations that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, and they are out there, and they are not spending the money, I'm afraid that they are going to have to te they, they are going to have to hear testimony from that money on the day of judgment. And the testimony, the, the, the witness of that gold, as it were, J uh, James chapter 5, is going to testify that, hey, you have not trusted in God and you have put your trust in filthy lucre. I don't want to be that. I don't want to go down that road. I think whenever Jesus returns, every local congregation ought to be broke and maybe a few million dollars in debt. I mean, they'll never have to pay it back. Think about all the good you could do with that. Now, let's... Uh, Let's go to first or second Corinthians chapter eight. So this this perfectly segues into a uh, or second Corinthians chapter nine. This perfectly segues into this next point. Why do we have the money? Why are we holding the money? If we're not, I mean, why why don't we put it to work? Are we afraid that if we spend our bank account in the church down to zero? Are we afraid that God will not bless us with more? Are we afraid that we won't have enough money to do the work? Well, we shouldn't be because there's a verse that addresses that exact, that, I mean, that exact worry. And it's a valid worry. You're not alone. The church in Corinth a year ago from the writing of this 2 Corinthians 
had been told by Paul, you need to gather up the money and take it and, and send it to Jerusalem for the needy folks in Jerusalem. Evidently, they had the gathering, and they never did send the money. And I can, I believe it's a, it's a reasonable inference that they were holding on to the money because they were a little bit afraid that once they saw those coffers dry up, that maybe God wouldn't be able to bless them anymore. Maybe they wouldn't have enough money to do the work. Let me tell you something. Having, having a nest egg in the bank account brings an awful lot of peace. It's very, very tempting to put your trust in that and not put your trust in God. Think about a person that doesn't have a dime in his savings account. He really has to trust God if he's going to do anything. You know, uh, back whenever I was a uh, apostate, I used to run around, play pool a lot, and I played pool for money quite a bit. One of the things you never want to do is play pool on scared money. Like if you're going to play a race to five for 5000 or something like that, you don't play for any more money than you're able to set on fire and walk away from. Because if you do, if you're playing on scared money, if you're playing a race to five for 5000 or um, a uh, or five ahead for 5000 or something like that, if you're playing on scared money, all you're going to think about is the money. You're not going to take the risk that you need to really tie that victory on. And you're going to be defeated by your opponent. And then you'll lose money you can't afford to lose. Where if you're, whatever you're playing for, if you're able to set it on fire and walk away from it and it not hurt you, then you're able to play for that amount of money. Hello, Missy Malone. It's good to see you. Good afternoon. We're we're rather late, Missy. We didn't get started till 45 minutes after our time we're supposed to get started. Anyway, so if you if you go into a if if you if you're a congregation, and let's say that you you budget, you work that budget down close, like every every month you're left over at, at the end of the month with five hundred dollars. That's I mean, that's that's a little, okay? And then a need comes up. So let's say you've got $2,500 in the bank. And then a need comes up for, to do a good work, but it's going to cost $2,800. Do you spend the money or not? I say you spend the money if it's a worthy cause. And you're just like, well, we're going to give that to God. Now, it's a lot easier to spend the money. It's a lot easier to spend. Um, I can't remember what I said now. We'll say you got twenty five hundred dollars in the bank. Let's say a need comes along that's twenty four hundred, so you're going to be left with a hundred dollar bill. It's a lot easier to spend twenty four hundred on something when you've got twenty four thousand left over than to spend twenty four hundred on something when you only have a hundred left over. But the great equalizer, the great, the great um, contentor. The comforter, he's the God of all comfort, is God. God is with us. If we spend the bank account down to zero, are we under the impression that God cannot build it back up? Scott Beck says, I always feel mixed emotions when the Salvation uh, Army bell ringers are collecting money. I want to be charitable and help people, but am I supporting a denomination by giving? Yeah, so that's... Honestly, that's a that's an issue of conscience, Scott. And I wouldn't I wouldn't condemn you one way or the other. Uh consciously, conscientiously, I don't support the Salvation Army. But I make sure that I am advocating for the charity that I do support, which is the Lord's Church, that we need to be busy. We don't in other words, here's what we don't need to do. I know this is wrong. We don't need to, as, a, as, a, as the Lord's church say, well, I'm not going to give you the Salvation Army because I'm supporting a denomination when I do that. But then we're not doing what the Salvation Army does. 
And quite frankly, I'm not sure. I'd have to look, but um, it may be better to, as far as fiscally and more, uh, more effective, it may be better to give your money to Goodwill than the Salvation Army, or to the Salvation Army than Goodwill. But I can't, I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. There's one that really treats their employees badly. They, they sell the stuff. I don't know. I, I, I can't remember. It's been too long since so I've looked into it, but. Between good, good, goodwill and the Salvation Army, I think just, I think the Salvation Army is a better charity, and you can always make the case. Well, if you're given the Salvation Army, and you're making, and the Salvation Army is making sure that homeless people are fed and clothed and have shelters and stuff like that, it's it's hard. Like you, you've got to work that out for yourself. I, conscientiously, I can't do it. But then on the on the the responsibility therein is I need to make sure that I am being charitable. So anyway, that's just something to think about. I'm sorry I don't have a very good answer for you there. But let's go to first or second Corinthians chapter nine. Let's set it in its context. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind. For which I boast of them, of you to them rather, in Macedo of, of Macedonia, excuse me, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, you make ready, lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. We that we say not ye should be ashamed in this, the same confident boasting. So you don't, you don't need to make us ashamed of our boasting. I, Paul is saying, I've been boasting of you to those of Macedonia, but I haven't sent those of Macedonia or come with Macedonia with them of Macedonia to you to get the ministration, the money, because you ain't got it gathered and ready for me. It's just, it's, it's somewhere in the coffers. You've got to gather it. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not as of covetousness. But this I say, and he's saying, look, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But verse 8 is the key, folks. Oh, Scott Beck says, I agree we should be doing the work ourselves rather than rely on others in the world. Yes, we do not need to uh, uh, we don't we do not need to subsidize the Lord's work, the church's work of benevolence with the government or with denominational organizations like the Salvation Army. You got that right. All right. Listen to this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. It gave me chills when I realized what Paul was telling the church at Corinth. And for those of you that have heard me any amount of time, this is old hat. You've heard me say this a hundred times. Paul is saying, look, send the money and don't lament the sending of the money. Don't lament your empty coffers because you still God is God is going to be able to give you enough grace that you will have all sufficiency for all work. In other words, if you've got a con if you're if you're a congregation of the Lord's people and you're five hundred members and you've got let's say you let's say you've got a million dollars in the bank, it's not implausible. I know well I I I, I, I keep saying I know, I know. I know I have known in the past. I don't know them any longer, so I don't know. But I've I've known congregations that have, you know, five hundred thousand dollars in the bank or even a million dollars in the bank. If you if you as an eldership, as a congregation even, decide to say, you know what, I'm going to give I'm going to endeavor to spend as much of that money as I can on growing the kingdom and if I'm doing all I can locally, we're going to branch out and we're going to send missionaries everywhere. 
What do you think God's going to do? You think God's going to leave you high and dry? You think God's going to look at your actions and be like, nah, I ain't helping them. I ain't working with them. I mean, is God with us or not? That's, that's a fair question. Are we hoarding money in the coffers of the Lord's church against the day of judgment? If so, it's going to eat our soul as a fire. Folks, this is, I talk about this quite a bit, and I talk about it, I, I, I do a podcast episode on it probably every three or four months, because I, mean, I think it needs said, I think it needs doing. Now, I turn your attention to this little article here, I oh, will go through it, hit the high points. I say, where's the... There we go. All right, this is Emperor Julian's Lament. Of course, in the beginning of the podcast, I shared with you the post. In the 4th century, Emperor Julian observed a remarkable, a remarkable phenomenon that set the early Christians apart, their unparalleled kindness to the poor. His observations, though meant as a critique, underscore a, script, a critical aspect of Christian identity and mission that remain just as relevant today. Julian noted with a mix of admiration and frustration, I believe, how Christians not only cared for their own, but also extended their generosity to those beyond their faith community. He lamented, Why do we think that this is sufficient and do not observe how the kindness of Christians to strangers has done most to advance their cause? Folks, Matthew chapter 25 is a fine note on which to end. I'm going to start reading in verse 31, and we're going to read this, this uh, parable here. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, or came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. The line of demarcation of faithful people of God versus unfaithful people of God. And incidentally, remember, this is, this is the kingdom. These are covenant people. This is people of the church, the analog of today. The line of demarcation between well done, good and faithful servants and depart from me, I never knew you, 
It's not how evangelistic you are. It's not how much money you put in the coffers, but it's benevolence. By this, a new commandment that I give unto you is love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples indeed, if you have love one to another. Charity, love. We are to act. We don't just say be you warmed and filled. We don't look at somebody and say, well, we got $100,000 in the bank account, but we can't help you with daycare. We can't help you with your mortgage. We can't help you uh, start that, get that, uh, get, get the legal fees for that business license taken care of. Folks, maybe we need to go talk to the Hebrews, the Jewish people, and and the Orthodox Jews and look at how they order their communities and take some take some notes. Because I, I don't I don't think we're quite in fellowship as much as we like to think we are. Do you think it makes it easier for denominations to work together and have worldwide nationwide programs to help their church members and those in need because they have a headquarters and meet to discuss matters as opposed to the Lord's church that is autonomous. Probably in some ways it does, but, the, and, and, and this is, Deborah, understand what I'm about to say is informed, but I would, before you repeat it for the truth, you and I both need to look into it. From my understanding it's not all of the things that denominations do. Like, obviously, if you've got in Arkansas, in northeast Arkansas, you've got the NEA Baptist Memorial Hospital. Well, that is probably done at the national level. Uh, members of the Lord's Church, the Churches of Christ in the United States and Canada, um, we and th that's why I say this could get into a really sticky situation. we got to make sure that we're not creating a parachurch organization. Um, I know that some people, the, the Church of Christ Disaster Relief Program, what's it called? Church of Christ Disaster Relief something. I know a lot of people think that that's a parachurch organization and really shouldn't exist, and there's two things for me on that. Number one, it's not a parachurch organization. I had about a two-hour conversation with the director of it back in 2015, 2016, I can't remember. Um, and he was more than happy to answer all my questions. And I was up front with him. I said, listen, I'm, I just want to talk to you because I don't know that I agree with the, uh, with, with, that the Bible gives you the authority to exist. But I've talked to him, and I believe the Bible does give him the authority, give that organization an authority to exist. And I believe it's scripturally ran. Run, ran, anyway. But then there's a second thing is, uh, with that Church of Christ disaster relief, folks that are against it are not so nearly opposed to it after the tornado comes and the Church of Christ disaster relief set up and start handing out supplies. So, Jan John Exum, I got an I got an I agree from John Exum. So anyway, I, I'm Deborah. Why did I say that? Oh yeah. So, the Church of Christ disaster relief is a good example of a bunch of congregations got together and said we're going to do this. Right, good morning, John Exum. Now I fully admit that that we got to be careful. It is a slope. I'm not sure how slippery it is, but it's a slope, and if we don't watch it, if we if we try to get too big and do too much, we would come across, we would have a, a, a parachurch organization, okay? But I think about Jonesboro, Arkansas, and the congregations that are there. Uh, there are sound congregations, and they could work together to have a shelter, to have a battered women's home, to have, to to at least have. Um, to, to to do like a, a homeless shelter or something like that. There's so many. There, we can do so much more than what we think. 
that we don't need a national headquarters for, that we still have autonomy, you know? So uh, to answer your question, probably in some things, but if you go to, if you go to rural middle Tennessee and there's a, a, a moderately sized town with, a homeless shelter that's run by the Lutherans. I don't think that the Lutheran national convention had to get involved in that because I think those denominations give their congregations enough autonomy and authority to, to operate within the confines of the rules of the denomination. So they are, they are functioning in that way, just like we are there. There's a certain amount of autonomy in those congregations, obviously though, they, it's a little different, but I think in some ways it makes it easier in some ways. Yeah, you're right. It, 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 it or, or you're right. It would make it easier, but in some ways I don't think it matters. Facebook user. It's an amazing work. I got the opportunity to help them after the fire in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Yeah. I wonder how many people in Gatlinburg, Tennessee were staunch opponents to the, uh, working of the church of Christ disaster relief. I wonder how many folks got water and clothes and, and temporary shelter and stuff like that and food. I wonder how many of them changed their mind, you know? Uh, I know I know it would be, again, I, I called the fella. I spent a couple hours on the phone with him, and I, I was transparent, and he was more than happy to answer my questions, and I, I grilled him pretty hard, you know? But anyway, folks, that is all I've got for you today. In the words of our brother, the Apostle John, as he is purported to have said late in his life, after he had been hauled in by the youngsters on a cot, he would stand up in his old age in Ephesus and prop on a cane, according to tradition, and he would preach a three-point sermon. And that little ser that sermon is, little children, love one another, love one another, love one another. And those are the words that I would leave you with. And if you love one another, you're going to love others. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the monetary support. Thank you so much for uh, sharing our content. You, we, we wouldn't be growing like we're growing without you. Thank you so much. And for those of you that send money to the PayPal, thank you. That money, every dime of that money goes into advertising and promoting of the show. And I think the numbers that we've been getting lately show that. I mean, we've been getting crazy numbers. It won't be long. Uh, the YouTube channel will be monetized where folks can give super chats in the live stream and stuff like that. So thank you so much. First Corinthians sixteen twenty two. We will end there. Jonathan, I cannot think of what that says. I think I know what that says, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared to quote it. Yep. Good one, Jonathan. Good one, John, rather. That's it. 196. That's crazy. It keeps growing. All right. Where am I at? 1622. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranathema or maranatha. Ma maran. Maranatha, yeah. Anathema Maranatha. In other words, you better love Jesus our Lord and don't claim to hate your brother that you have seen out of one side of your mouth and love God that you haven't seen out of the other. God bless every one of you. Remember, uh, the, the ways to support us is in the show notes, but here they are. Substack, $5 a month. Do it for free, but you can opt to have a five dollar a month subscription that's the greatest way to help us out near churches at gmo.com send me send send uh, any amount of money you want to there every bit of that money goes into the advertising budget promotion budget budget for the show and then christianity now streams we need 500 subscribers is our is our immediate goal and you can follow us on facebook and i even upload on rumble sometimes and wait a second uh, first Corinthians one, two, three, that's Twitter, Twitter. Um, hold on a second. 
what am I doing here? Where where are we, Twitter? I've got a Oh yeah, follow us on X. Y'all, we're getting I mean, we're getting followers on Twitter. Uh, it's awesome. Uh but it's X, also known as Twitter, Christianity Now at First Chronicles 1232. First Chronicles 1232. That's on Twitter. Anyway, that's all I've got here. God bless every one of you. This has been Tony Brew with Cogitations. Like, subscribe, share, follow us, and subscribe on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and TuneIn Radio. Thanks for tuning in and listening. And, folks, we'll catch you.